N E N S A U N S Who is He? Who loves you? Who do you love? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, according to my Bible, he turned the world right side up. He caused the demons to flee. He caused the dead to be raised. He healed the sick. And he spoke to them like no other. So welcome to the rock, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jesus said, upon this rock I built my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is not just another Sunday morning service, ladies and gentlemen. This is the third day of a very important Sunday. The first day was 2,000 years ago. You may wonder why it was the first day. Because according to the Bible, 1,000 years is just like a day. So 2,000 years is two days. So two days ago, there was a Sunday event. We had the third day. And you know what I'm talking about. When you talk about the third day, you're talking about resurrection day. You're talking about something that you have never seen before. And so ladies and gentlemen, two days ago, according to Matthew chapter 28, the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people no, that's not that one. That's 27. Ah, this phone without my permission move over. <laughs> and that is not going to happen. Okay, Matthew chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, two days ago, Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, let's call her Mary number one, and the other Mary, Mary number two. On their way to the grave. I can just imagine two girls walking. Early dawn. Intentionally. Walking a direction. Because it was important for them. Do you know that in life. You're going to be a winner. You got to intentionally sometimes do something. You know like when Brandon saw. Vanessa here. How many years ago that you saw her the first time? 11 years ago. He, say, he just didn't say, that's a cute girl. That is the truth. But he has to intentionally make the move. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask them what it is. But he got to intentionally make the move to win that girl's heart. And 11 years later, and how many kids? Three kids later, there they are sitting here. You know what I'm talking about. You have to intentionally make a move if you want to be part of the kingdom of God and what he's doing in this generation. Just like the two Marys, Mary 1 and Mary 2. They intentionally early morning while Peter and the big boys who are sleeping, shame on them disciples. You know, I guess, never mind. <clears throat> The two Marys intentionally went the direction of the tomb. I just want to welcome my friends here, Dan Allen and his wife. I'll give them a hand. You know, those are friends of mine. Yeah. Dan's mom and dad were Christian and Missionary Alliance in the island of Timor, where I came from. Known his mom and dad for many, many years. So I appreciate Dan and his wife coming here. They in Terima kasih, terima kasih, Dan. And that's, we're talking heavenly language, you know. Because <laughs> when you got to heaven, there's only one language you're going to speak, ladies and gentlemen, and that is Indonesian. Just so that you're sure. And so, uh, Dan grew up in the island there. And were part, or his parents were part of the, what God is doing in that part of the world. And so Dan and his wife intentionally come here. You have made the right intention to be here. So the two Mary intentionally walked toward the grave. And I wonder, what were they talking about? If two men walk in the morning toward the grave, I'll tell you, they ain't going to say nothing. That's just how us boys are, you know, with exceptions. 
But when the two girls walk somewhere, you know. <laughs> when you ask a guy, hey, how's the party tonight? He said, it's wonderful. That's all he's going to tell you. Bottom line. When you ask a girl, how's the party tonight? You better have half an hour for the presentation. <laughs> because he's going to tell you about the girl that came with a red dress. Oh, she tried to steal the attention of everybody. And make us look bad. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? We don't repeat that in church. Oh, they will give you all the information, the details. So the two Mary was talking. Mary one said to Mary two, <clears throat> you know, we are on our way over to the tomb here. I'm just getting a little emotional, you know. Because I remember that day when we were on that wedding time. Oh, that bride, that girl, she was just gorgeous. <laughs> I just remember, you know. On my wedding day, too. And it was, it was, it, it was good. And uh, as the days were passing, on the third day, I think, they ran out of wine. And Mary, too, said, yeah, I remember that. I look at the face of the um, master ceremony, and he was more than nervous. You know, you can tell, you know, that uh, something's wrong is going on. And then I saw Jesus came over. And he was talking to the boys out there. And they begin to get water from the well and fill up the water pots, you know. And I was thinking to myself, what did they do that for? You know, that is for washing the feet of the guests when they're coming into the party, you know. And everybody was inside. There's no more water needed to wash the feet. But they fill up the <clears throat> tank or the containers with water. And I saw one of them dip the container into the... Uh, uh, the uh, the big, uh, what do you call them, that tank, the, the big, yeah, and then brought it over to the master ceremony. He tasted it, and his face, I swear, light up. And he went over to the um, bridegroom, and I overheard the conversation. Usually, people gave the best wine first. And after people drunk and didn't know the difference what they're drinking after. <laughs> now, I can't relate to that because I've never done it, you know. Uh, doesn't make me any better than you are. That's just the way it is. I was in Chardonnay, France the other day. You know, Chardonnay, for those of you who drink, that is the city or the town, the little village where the Chardonnay wine, the white wine, is originated. So my friends took me there to the Chardonnay, city of Chardonnay. We went to the original place where the Chardonnay wine is created. And so the owner gave me a glass of the Chardonnay and said, Sir, can you taste it? This is the best there is from Chardonnay. I didn't want to be difficult. So I just take a little taste of it just to be precise, just to be nice. And I smiled at him and I said, Yes, sir, it tastes good to me. But let me tell you something. When you have tasted the wine that Jesus changed from water, nothing else come close. Even the Chardonnay from Chardonnay will never match that with the master of the universe created. Because he's Alpha and Omega. He's the one that took water and changed it into wine. And even the master ceremony said, how come... You keep the best for last. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here in the rock this morning because I came with a message that he has kept the best for last. Oh, this is the third day. They were on the first day, Mary and Mary. We are on the third Sunday here, ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years later. He is going to save the best for the last. And I'm here to proclaim that this is the generation that will see the greatest harvest that no generation before us has ever seen. <laughs> Why? Because on the first day, they only have about 2 million people round about in that region. Today, we have 7 billion people in you know, the five continents and the seven oceans of the world. And because of the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost that came in the day of Pentecost that is present now because of Jesus, we're going to see the greatest number 
of people come to know Jesus. Oh, I'm excited. Do you know that on the day of Pentecost, you know on the day of Pentecost, they spoke 14 distinct languages. And one of them, according to, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Acts chapter 2, spoke Arabic. Oh, the Holy Ghost chose Arabic 2,000 years ago to be spoken. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, those Arabic-speaking friends of ours, they are going to come in these last days speaking Arabic for the glory of Jesus. Oh, they're going to come to the kingdom. They're going to come by the millions. You know why? Because Jesus saved the best for last. And not only this is the generation that will see the greatest harvest in our time. You better be ready, hard rock, guys. You better be ready to rock and roll. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Ghost is going to propel you. He's going to burn your feet that you can't st uh, sit still. You're going to say to yourself, there's something burning inside of me. I'm going to go over to the housing over here. I'm going to go over there. And I'm going to go where the Holy Spirit's going to tell me to do. Because the fire in me is propelling me to reach the loss. And when you do that, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see the power of God release like you have never seen before. But before I jump ahead into what I would like to share with you, let's go back to the two Marys. So Mary 1 said to Mary 2, boy, that was a night that, um, I mean, I never, when we went to the wedding, I never expect that we're going to experience a miracle. The first miracle, changing water into wine. And Mary 1 said to Mary 2, yeah. You were staggering out of the room because you just drink one too many. Oh, Mary too said to Mary one, come on, Mary. I wasn't staggering. I was just, you know, just being myself. You know. <laughs> Whatever them girls say, never mind. And the other Mary said, you know, that was a, that was a great night. But I remember when we were in Bethany. You remember that, Mary? And we are on our way over to the cave, you know, the tomb, just like we are about to do now. And all of a sudden, oh, first time I saw him cry. He loves him so much. He loves you so much. loves you so much. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. And because of that love, he said, Lazarus, come forward. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my humble opinion. You can't read it in the Bible, but just the way I was looking at the situation. Lazarus didn't walk out of the tomb. Because when you're dead in those days and they wrap you up, then when they start, you might be half alive. When they finish wrapping you up like a mummy, you'll be dead for sure. <laughs> you know? And when you're a mummy, you can't walk out, you can't move a finger. So when Jesus at Lazarus come forward, I can just see the power of the word and the Holy Ghost just propel Lazarus like a, you know, a rocket, you know. He was catapulted. Jing, 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 jing. <laughs> he stood there alive. Whew, thank you, Lord. I'm alive, but I can't breathe, you know. <laughs> because even his head was all wrapped up, you know. So Jesus had loosened the guy, yeah. Because you see, it's one thing to be alive. But it's another thing, ladies and gentlemen, to be alive and free. Oh, they let him loose. And Lazarus said, ah, now that feels better. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus, he said. He was alive and he was free. Now he can walk. Oh, the other Mary, Mary number two. Did you, did you remember Lazarus come down from you know, his perch and uh, sort of kind of you know, talk to us. Isn't that cute? You know? <laughs> He's, I remember that day. And then Mary said, you know, I remember the day when <clears throat> we were up in the desert, you know, 20 plus thousand people. We were all hungry. 
And the little boy, little Johnny, eight years old, contribute the little lunch, five piece of bread that he got in the lunch box to Jesus. And you know, Mary, I was just thinking, that boy is brave. He dare to take a risk with Jesus. Because, you know, either the miracle happened and everybody eat and he go back home with one basket of bread. Oh, Peter's going to swallow up those five pieces of bread. <laughs> and little Johnny can just kiss the lunch goodbye. But you know what? I admire that little Johnny. He gave the last that he has. Because he dared to partner with Jesus. And take the risk of taking his side, Jesus' side. Miracle of multiplication to meet the need of the multitude. And then Daddy Mary said, you know, I remember that too. <clears throat> I eat like a pig. Well, the Jewish girls wouldn't say pig, so they were together. I eat like a camel. <laughs> or a cow or something, you know what I mean? <clears throat> so, um, but then Mary too said to Mary one, you know, now coming to think of it, I appreciate the miracle. But I'm feeling a little guilty. <laughs> what are you guilty about, girl? Well, because when Andrew passed by and asked, you know, for a little contribution for the miracle that's about to take place. And I saw little Johnny gave the five piece of bread. Now that we're talking. I had bagel and lock in my lunchbox. And I could have given that to Andrew to give to Jesus so he can multiply it. But now I feel terrible that I didn't do it. The other Mary said, oh, you know, you can't really change what happened. You, then you can, we can change it now. I feel terrible too because I have a juicy piece of prime rib. <laughs> and a box of salad next to it. Greek salad to boot. With feta cheese. You know what I'm talking about? Oh. But I also withhold that and didn't give it to Philip. Philip was coming my way. He can smell the, um, what do you call that? Prime rib, you know, in my lunch box. And he was kind of giving me a hint. Let's give it to Jesus. And I said, not on my life, Philip. <laughs> I ain't got nothing here. Go on. After all, the young boy just gave the piece of bread, and that should be sufficient. But you know what, Mary, now that we are walking toward the you know, tomb, the, I'm getting a little guilty here. Because you know what, Mary? If I gave that prime rib with the Greek salad, and you gave the lock and bagel to the disciples to give it to Jesus, can you imagine the extent of the miracle of multiplication? Not only will eat the lousy piece of bread. Now, if you're hungry, any bread is not lousy. I mean, it's good. But can you imagine to have the bread and the luck and bagel and the salad and the prime rib? And who knows something else? You have 5,000 Jewish mama there. You think they go to the desert with the kids with nothing on their lunchbox? You got to be kidding. <laughs> they got something in their lunchbox. If that mama is a mama, would her whatever, her mama would. But you know what? Only one little boy gave what he got. If the 5,000 mamas can contribute what they have to Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine what happened with the miracle of multiplication? It will be just a feast and a barbecue. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 when you go to this uh, all-you-can-eat uh, buffet, she, it will make Vegas, you know, look tinsy <laughs> to compare with the barbecue, with the, with the buffet that Jesus would have created that night. <laughs> you want bagel? I don't like bagel. I like prime rib. Oh, you want prime rib? Uh, you kind of, but uh, I'd rather go for this and that. Man, what a day would that have been. But you see, the miracle only happened for the breath that was given. 
and all the others that wasn't given never got a chance to be multiplied by the miracle that Jesus performed for the sake of the multitude. So Mary said to Mary, I feel a little guilty now that we are going that way, remembering that shame on me, Mary said. But that Mary said, I tell you what, when we see him, see him in the tomb there, we'll apologize. And we'll make it up another time. I just wonder, ladies and gentlemen, what is that that we have withhold in the past when we have an opportunity to partner with Jesus? But you know what? I'm talking to you about that, not to feel guilty, but just to do what the other two Marys said. We didn't do well then, but you better believe it. We're going to make it up good time. And this time when I got an opportunity, I'm going to give everything that I got to Jesus so that the miracle of multiplication will meet the need of the multitude in the nation in our generation. So they're on their way to the tomb. And all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, a severe earthquake had occurred. For the angel of the Lord ascended from heaven and came and rolled away the rock. Meaning, you know, you know what I'm talking about. The, you know the coffin. Don't look at me. See, what are you talking about? You, know? you guys are smarter than that, all right? And the angel said, don't you come here no more. I know you come here because you remember what happened before resurrection. You remember the day when you're up in a mountain and he who is God incarnate spoke. Blessed are those who are hungry, who are thirsty, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who have a pure heart because they shall see God. That was quite a Sunday morning rock service. And we were there, the two Mary said. And the angel said, yes, it was wonderful yesterday before resurrection. But he said to them, girls, turn around. The past was wonderful. But the future will outshine the past like you have never seen it before. Because the past was wonderful. Oh, but the best is in the future. So turn around, girls. Turn around. Because if they turn around in the first Sunday, two days ago, this third Sunday, we better turn around, ladies and gentlemen. Because the action is in the tomorrows. Because Jesus is ready to do something that the world has never seen before. <clears throat> so the two Marys turn around. One Mary one said to Mary two. You wanna go in, you go in, baby, but I ain't going. He looks pretty serious. You know that guy there, the angel, whatever he is. <coughs> I ain't going there. But let us listen to what he told us. They got to the house and wake up Peter, and in between, you know, Jesus met them. You know, friend, when you turn around from the tomb and go in the direction that the Holy Ghost is telling you to go, he will meet you on the road. And he said, Mary, Mary, how are you doing? How are you doing, girls? They were speechless. <laughs> and when they got to the house, they said, Peter, John, Philip, Andrew, wake up, you lazy poos, or whatever they say. <sighs> We just met the resurrected master. And he and the angels told us, God off your royal behind. I don't know if they say things like that, but I did. God off your, you fill in the blank. And got yourself to the mountain which he has designated. Pronto. No time to waste. Because he's waiting for you. With a mission that will change the destiny of nations, including the great United States of America. So the boys got on, 
catch the camel on the way over or run, whatever they do in those days. <coughs> they didn't have the Uber to get over there, so they went in with whatever, the two feet that they have. And in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28, thank you, Pastor. May your reward for the cold bottle of water be yours in abundance. <coughs> The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. So just like all of you here this morning, you came to the right place. You came to the rock. You have worshipped him. But some doubted. I wonder who is the doubting fellow and his friends. Some. So that means they have the gang leader. What's his name? Oh, poor Thomas. He always got that nickname that he can't shake it off. We call him Doubting Thomas. But doubting doesn't mean not believing. You don't, try, you don't touch his side and his hand and not believing. Doubting simply means your mind couldn't quite figure out what he's going to do. Because, you know, the mission is almost far greater than what you can understand. You know, Thomas went to um, Berkeley and he finished his PhD uh, uh, in uh, the other one, Berkeley. And what's the other one? No, no, the other one, the big one. Stanford, Stanford, that's what I have in mind. Oh, let's pitch in Harvard to boot. So Thomas went to Stanford and went to Hartford. He knows what is what. Oh, but he didn't know who Jesus really fully is. So he was doubting a little bit. And Jesus could have praised the ones who were worshiping and scolded Thomas for not believing. Ah, he didn't have no time for such things. He said, all the power. In heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go unto all the world and preach this gospel. You know what Jesus is saying there? He just break the boundaries. Because so far for three and a half years, he has ministered all over a small little territory called Israel. But this is a new day, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to break out from the boundaries of one small nation into a world out there. Into Indonesia, India, Pakistan, China, Brazil, the nations of the world, Europe, Germany, Israel, you name it. Because that encounter will determine the destiny of nations and the greatest harvest that the church will ever see. And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, we are sitting here in the rock today. We are loving Jesus. And ain't the end yet. I said, devil, you watch out. Because these people in the rock this morning, they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Their encounter with Jesus will cause them and propel them to move on in this life. Not satisfied with what they have experienced yesterday. But they are going to step in unto the future and fulfill the mission and the destiny that God has given them. <laughs> Amen. Case in point, Doubting Thomas. You know, one would think that Doubting Thomas wouldn't really accomplish much. Huh? Don't you be too fast. Because from all the disciples that met Jesus in the mountain, one of them went down to Ethiopia. I don't know who. They'll let the theologians figure it out. Google it if you want to know. <laughs> and the church in Ethiopia still exists today because of that one disciple went south to Africa. Another one went to Persia. Another one went to Turkey. Paul and the other fellows went to Macedonia and Europe, you know, eventually. Oh, but ladies and gentlemen, doubting Thomas went the furthest. You know what? He went all the way, half around the world to the uttermost part of the world, all the way to India. With no Air India. Emirates, United Airlines, or American Airlines in those days. <laughs> I mean, it takes 
an intentional determination to obey and partner with Jesus and willing to pay the price to go the distance. If all you want is the comfort of Roseville, then stay in the comfort of Roseville. You'll go to heaven. The only problem is you're going to miss out of a few exciting things from here to heaven. And Thomas said, hey, come rain, come sunshine. He said to Peter, you guys go to Rome. I'm going to India. I'm going to where nobody has ever gone before. Ah, I'm going to a place where even angels don't dare go in. You know, that is Thomas. The doubting Thomas. He couldn't wrap his mind about, uh, around the, the, the greatness of the mission. But he decided, it ain't my abilities that's going to make this happen. It is my ability, my availability and his ability combined that's going to change the destiny of nations. He said, Jesus, you know, I'm available to you. You tell me where to go and I'm going. And whatever I'm lacking, you're going to supply. And wherever I go, you will be right there smack with me. And I reckon if you're there, it's going to be all right. And all right it was. Because today, 2,000 years later, the church, Martoma Church in India is alive and kicking. 200 million people today are loving Jesus in India. And many more are going to come, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Rabbi. Yay! Whoa! You know, some people like the Broncos. Some people like the 49ers and the Seahawks. People ask me, which one you're for? I'm for the winner. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I watch the, what you call that, Super Bowl, you know, I'm always rooting for the winner. In that way, there I don't have to get nervous if one team dropped the ball and said, <laughs> got mad. No, 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 no. Whoever's the winner is my team. <laughs> and you know what? By doing that, I always win. <laughs> I finish every Super Bowl smiling <laughs> because my team won. And I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, Team Jesus never lost. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Somebody, somebody. Aaron, ho. Stand up. No, I said stand up. I'm standing up. Glory. 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 Oh, that's weak. Glory. Wow. Glory. Glory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't sit there in the 49ers stadium and... Uh, your man touched down and you say, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't do that. You kick the TV. You gasoline in the stupid beer, non-alcoholic beer. You pinch the wife. And you said, look what happened, honey. He just got a touchdown. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus just did a touchdown. Whoa! Whoa! When Thomas got to India. I was in India the other day, and I told the church in India, I said, you know what? Thomas started it 2,000 years ago. You guys better finish it up. Or I'm going to come back, and you're going to be in big doo-doo. Because if doubting Thomas can do, can do his part, then the believers in India today can rise and do greater than what Thomas has ever done. Come on. And that's why I'm here this morning. I'm counting on each one of you to rise and give the devil a headache he'll never recover from. And you reach the lost in this neighborhood and tell them that Jesus is and Jesus always will be. Oh, let me tell you a story. Jesus said to the disciples, wherever you go, I what? I'm always be with you. So the point is this, if you want Jesus to go to the hospital, you can stay watching TV at home. You got to get your royal behind to the hospital. Because when you got to the hospital, he will be right there with you. Oh, a case in point. I was in Argentina some time back. 
the other day. I always say the other day because, you know, traveling so much, I never remember when I was where. <laughs> and there's always somebody who Google it and say, Mel, it wasn't two years ago. It was three or it was one, whatever the information is. I just say the other day. It's safe. <laughs> because the other day means it happened from a minute ago to the day I found Jesus, 54 years. You know? So it, it, it works for me. So the other day I was in Argentina. We have a big meeting. I was up here on the platform and I said to the people, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mel Tari. I came from the island of Timor where Mr. Dan Allen here and his parents were missionaries. And I'm not here alone tonight. I came with an old friend of mine that I've known for 54 years. He promised to be there when I came. And he's here tonight. And his name is Jesus. And I said, uh, he and I have an agreement that I'll do the preaching. And he will do the rest. So I said, I'll be preaching here with a translator tonight. But uh, wherever you're sitting, just kind of be sensitive. Because my friend Jesus might be walking down the aisle and he might tap you on the soldier, whatever. I can never tell what he's doing. But whatever he's going to do is going to be good. So I said, you just, just be cognizant of that. <coughs> So I was preaching here about halfway doing, going, preaching. And all of a sudden, my eye caught three people pushing the wheelchair over to the left. There's a platform like this, you know, and there's like a ramp over. The only ramp in the left. So these three people were pushing their wheelchair, and they're standing behind me. I look back, and they were pushing empty wheelchairs. So I said to the one up front, who was sitting in that wheelchair right there? He said, I was, sir. <laughs> I said, then what are you doing? You know, pushing the empty wheelchair. How long have you been sitting there? He said, seven years I have. And he figured out, tell me this, you know, scientific name for the disease, whatever that is. I forgot it altogether. Couldn't even get it. But he said, I've been sitting there seven years. My body over here, 17 years. Body over there is whatever. And he said, uh, you're right. While you're preaching, Jesus come down the aisle where the three of us were sitting. He touched me, touched him, touched him. So he said, here we are, sir. We just want the folks here to know that when the healer, Jesus, show up, it is healing that he granted to each one of us. It was a miracle. Oh. Oh, it make the touchdown that the Patriot guy, what's his name? Tom Brady. Even Tom Brady have to get down to his knees and say, yeah, Jesus. Oh, rah, bah, 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 bah. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus said to the disciples, go unto all the world. I am destroying the limitation of the boundary of one little country. And now I'm sending you to the nations. And I'm glad he did. You know why? Because the Dutch missionaries came from Indonesia to the island of Timor. That's how my grandparents joined the church and my mom and dad later. And later on, 54 years ago, I accepted Jesus. It was a neat story. I'll just give you just the bottom line of it. I was sick with malaria in high school, you know, when I was on my 16, 17, grew up. Looked for healing, never found it. But 54 years ago, I opened my heart and embraced Jesus. It was so exciting the day I found Jesus. You remember that old song? Some of you are too young to know it, you know. You know, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus was my sins away. And whatever that is, I remember some, uh, forgot some of the words, but you know what I'm talking about. Oh, that was the happiest day in my life. Because that is the day, ladies and gentlemen, that I know that, I know that my sins were forgiven. Never to be remembered again. Whew. What a relief. That was the day that God became my father. Not just Queen Elizabeth become my mother. Huh? That would be okay. Oh, but when God is your father, you don't worry about Queen Elizabeth whether you know her or not. I was in London the other day with one of my students that I taught in the class. And uh, I said, I have a, a half a day. So Annabelle came over and I said, bring me over to Buckingham Palace. So we went. 
And when we got to in front of the palace, I was just pulling her leg. I said, you know, Annabelle, you know what? <clears throat> I cancel my appointment with Her Majesty for lunch because I'm just going to walk around with you. And Annabelle, she couldn't get it straight. She just about to cry. She said, you do that, Papa Mel. You cancel your appointment with Her Majesty for me. I said, yes. But then I said, Annabelle, don't be so... So I told her I didn't have any appointment, but I just want to make a point that she's important. She's loved by Jesus. So Annabelle, appreciate the illustration, so to speak. <clears throat> but that was the day that God became my father, and I embrace and receive eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, this life is temporal. Like it or not, a hundred years from now, none of you will be sitting here looking pretty. Hopefully, all of you will be in heaven walking with Jesus. I trust that it will be so. And for those of you who are watching this video stream here, if you don't know this Jesus and you haven't received this eternal life, now, right now is your time. Just simply say, Jesus, come into my heart. I need you. I want you to forgive me. And when you do that, my friend, from your heart, you never know what's going to happen. But let me tell you what happened to me. When Jesus came to my heart, I got so excited that I get out of the door. The first person I met, I told them, my friend John. I said, John, get down to your knees. <laughs> Pastors sometimes need to be reminded, you know, what to do. <laughs> and I said, confess all your sins. <clears throat> Poor John said, which one? I said, the ones you can remember. The ones you forgot, I'll remind you. <laughs> my old friend, you know, he's my old friend. So John did, and I said, John, ask Jesus to come to your heart, and he did. I said, John, that's the way it is, buddy. You and I am going to be in heaven together. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I'll give, give, give pastor here. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and I said, tell you what, John, heaven is such a nice place, it wouldn't be right. As a matter of fact, it is wicked. It is obscene. It is unacceptable if we left somebody behind and don't go to heaven if it is such a good place. And if hell is such a terrible place, we got to do everything we can to prevent anybody from going there. So I said, John, you go north, I go south. Tell everybody about Jesus. And you know what? We did it. We tell everybody about Jesus. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I started 54 years ago. And haven't stopped yet. Because 54 years ago, the Holy Spirit came down just like he did in the day of Pentecost to the disciples. When they accept the mission and they know that the boundaries of nations and people has been broken. And now it is their time to go unto every tribe and language and nations everywhere. Oh, it got heaven excited. And God began to do things that he couldn't have done otherwise. Because the gospel came to the island of Timor. They only have water turned into wine, you know, one time in Cana. Eat the heart out, I told them, because in the island of Timor, God changed water into wine once a month for five years. You can count it 60 times, ladies and gentlemen. Yay, somebody! When I show up, it's not church time. It is hallelujah time. It is Jesus time. All right? So don't give me this. Oh, Jesus! The Dutch missionaries came to my island for 60 years. 80,000 people come to Jesus. But when the Holy Ghost came down and we went outside to the neighbors, in the first six months, 80,000 people come to Jesus. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the generation that will see the greatest harvest we'll ever see in. This is the generation that will see the release of the power of God unprecedented. Unfortunately, I have only have four minutes to go. But I want to tell you something. When you dare to go and Jesus is there with you, you'll never know what is going to happen. I was in Madagascar and a young pastor friend, 40 years old, said to me, Papa Mel, you know, I'm 73, so I qualify to become his dad. You know, he's only 40, so, you know, 33 is different. It's kind of 
qualify him and me to be a son and I'm for the Papa Mel. He said, Papa Mel, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost just like the disciples. And so I said, you got down to your knees and asked Jesus because John the Baptist said, I will baptize you unto water. But he that will come after me will baptize you into the Holy Ghost and yeah. he was down in his knees. We prayed for him. When he got off his knees, he said, Papa Mel, I want to see miracles. I said, no guarantee for that from me. I never perform any miracles. I've seen people raised from the dead, the blind see, the crippled walk, but I've never done no miracles. I just pursue Jesus and pursue the loss. So I suggest you pursue Jesus and pursue the loss and let heaven decide what miracle is going to take place. America, let me tell you something. If you pursue miracles, you'll never find it. But if you pursue Jesus and the lost, miracles will pursue you. And you will be astounded and surprised every corner and every step that you're going to take. So Pastor Rodolfo accepted Jesus. I mean, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. I was in Marseille, France, here this last June. <clears throat> Got a text from him. He said, Papa Mel, I'm going to take the six-hour train ride from Paris, Paris. To Marseille and I want you to pray for me again so that this fire in me he got the fire but he said I just want this fire to just you know just blow up here because this is my first time in France preaching the gospel so I want to make sure that the fire go with me because I told him when Moses saw the fire in the bush that is where he heard the voice of the great I am and when you obey the voice of the great I am no Pharaoh no demons in hell no red, uh, what you call that, uh, Red Sea can stop the move of the Son and the Child of God. So we pray for him. He came down to Marseille, take the six-hour train ride, poor guy. He got to Marseille, he met me, and we hugged. In the morning when we finished hugging, this guy. You've never seen a hungry person like that young man. I didn't even give him the invitation, told him to do nothing. He was down on his knees, his hand was up, his eyes was looking to heaven. And all the white folks were passing us by because he was kneeling in the middle of the road. I mean the hallway where everybody's going to the security. So they have to go around us. I was thinking to bring him in the corner there and pray. He, he ain't going to no corner. <clears throat> because down in his knees, eyes closed, hands up, heart open and heart hungry. I said, a hungry one will be satisfied according to the man who spoke the Beatitudes. Pray for him. I received a text message about two weeks later. He said, Papa Mel, I was preaching all over and I was up in northern France. About a couple of days later, uh, Mama called me and said, uh, Pastor, can you pray for my daughter? She died yesterday. She's been dead for 24 hours. So the pastor told the Mama to take Thank God for Steve Jobs to take the iPhone or maybe the Samsung Galaxy. Who knows? <laughs> Not sure about which one, but so put the phone on the girl's ear. 18-year-old girl. Can you put that girl's picture up here, please? That is Andrea, Andrea Nina, 18 years old. And the moment the pastor prayed, Andrea Nina heard her, her name call. And a big hand took her spirit and Re reunite her with her body. Andranida woke up. For what I know, that is the first miracle of resurrection in modern Europe. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I believe Jesus is telling us something. Europe will be aflame by the fire of the Holy Ghost. Oh, the Martin Luther's and the Calvin's What's the other gentleman's name? Wesley's. Oh, they have done well in their time. But Europe will see the fire of the Holy Ghost in this generation. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here this morning because I'm going to tell you, don't go back to the past as good as it was. Turn and encounter the resurrected Christ who wants you to go unto your neighbors, unto the nations, because you're going to see the release of His power. Like Pastor Rodolfo saw in France. We are the generation that will see the release of the power of God unprecedented. But let me tell you, for the Holy Ghost and fire to come, somebody better be hungry 
Somebody better be thirsty. 40 years ago, I was the best man in the wedding of a young man and a young woman. They went to the honeymoon in Catalina Island. When they came back, I picked them up in the boat there. And the next day, I put them in the plane and sent them to Indonesia to become the first missionaries. They caught the mission bug and they have never stopped. But from there, they go to Philippines, China. And 20 plus years ago, they went to Mozambique. 5,000 churches later and millions of people touched and 153 raised from the dead. Heidi and Roland Baker. She just texted me this morning. She's in Jordan. You know, you know where Jordan is. She was there with the refugees. I came here, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm looking for a hungry one. Somebody who doesn't care if everybody's walking toward the security. He was down on his knees. He said, Jesus, fill me with the Holy Ghost and fire. My question this night, play us a little something here in a minute. Is there anybody hungry here this morning? Is there a hungry one here? Then get off your royal behind and get to the front. Quickly. Is there anybody hungry, thirsty here this morning? You know, I'm 73 years old. I don't take no for an answer. You know, I just don't. When you're 73, you own the right to be ornery. Not that way, you know what I mean? But when I know something good for you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't give you too much time to be thinking whether I need it or not. I said, come on down. Come on down. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the third Sunday in the history of the church. And you are the one here. Okay, you can come down there as long as you move, you know, a feet or two. And that's not going to be nobody here singing, just as I am. That, that's the Billy Graham time. He's gone. We're going to do it the new way here, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be you and I. Say, Jesus, I'm hungry. Jesus, I'm hungry. Oh, somebody said this prayer. Lord Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit and fire and propel me into my destiny for the sake of the loss here in Roseville, here in California, here in the USA and in the nations of the world. I give you my heart. I give you my future. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I will obey you. Because upon this rock, I stand. And you, Jesus, will move me to my destiny. For your honor and glory. In Jesus' name. And somebody here said, Amen. 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 In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. He's here. He's here. Don't go back home without what you need. Go back home with your miracle because he's here. Let's give it up for Pastor Mel. Come on.